Um, so my question is about uh, trust. Um, and you know, I'm fully with you that you said Bitcoin, one of the sort of central uh, innovations here is that it's trustless. And then it seems a little bit strange to me that you then say there's a revolution in trust because this is trustless. And what a, like, it seems to me that a more accurate way of phrasing that might be like there's a revolution in self-reliance. Like you, you radically trust yourself to keep your own keys secure and all of this kind of stuff. And I think that, you know, like as a computer user, who's, you know, relatively able to keep my computer secure and, and use these things that's, you know, enormously sort of uh, attractive to me. But I wonder if it then sort of brings in issues of social scaling. So not necessarily the yes. technical, but like this radical self-reliance does pose quite an issue in terms of the social scale that we're talking here. Right. That's a really great observation. I think when I say a revolution of trust, what I'm talking about is that when you organize trust in a decentralized manner, eventually you come to trust in the aggregate operation of a network, network-centric trust, and the aggregate collaboration on the same consensus rules of thousands of participants. You can't do the Bitcoin trust by yourself. You don't trust anybody. But in the end, you trust the system because everybody is using the same consensus rules. So you have this emergent model for trust in a network-centric, game-theoretical, market-based security system that is massively decentralized. In terms of self-reliance, this is a tricky one. We're at the infancy of this technology, which means that today one of the biggest challenges is that it's very difficult for individuals to secure their own Bitcoin. And in many cases, that leads people to rely on third parties and get goxed, right? and <laughs> concentrate all of their funds in one big, shiny honeypot that is an irresistible target. And, you know, as I like to say, there are two types of uh, centralized exchanges in this world, uh, those that have been hacked and those that will be hacked. Um, so that's a problem. Now, you can look at that and say, that's a problem that's insurmountable, and write an article about it, just like those journalists did in 1997. Or you can say, huh, that's a problem that if I solve with simple-to-use, easy-to-back-up devices like, say, hardware wallets, and take the cost of that down, or embed it in a smartphone, or build it as a trusted chip, or make it into a necklace, and make it so cheap that you can buy this device for a dollar. Now, that's a billion-dollar market. Right? Making Bitcoin easy to secure in an individual, empowering way that doesn't require you to centralize your assets, that's a billion-dollar project. And I, I think what we're seeing is the rapid development of exactly that. So, is it easy? Absolutely not. Most people who have Bitcoin... Okay, let's do a quick poll. How many of you who have Bitcoin are absolutely comfortable that your Bitcoin is secure? I'm not raising my hand. <laughs> That's just asking for trouble, right? <laughs> That's tempting karma. I am reasonably certain that I have managed to maintain my security for the last five years. And, you know, I have a master's degree, which was mostly focused on information security. That's not the level that most people will have. So how do you make it easy for everyone? How do you make it seamless? How do you make it uh, transparent? How do you make it invisible? There are great companies that do just that. I like to tell people I sent my first email in 1989. My mother sent her first email in 2009, 20 years to the day after that. Sending my first email involved downloading mail software from the BSD distribution, compiling it with a compiler on a Unix command line, firing it off, setting up a mailbox, attaching to a remote store and forward UCP copy server, sending the email, waiting three days for it to traverse the internet. Elapsed time, six hours of highly complicated computer science. My mom went swish on her iPad. Right? That's the, that's the skills gap. So, how do we make it so that securing your Bitcoin is swish? And the company that solves that, and it is solvable, and makes it intuitive, reflexive, 
that company is going to be very successful. And I think there are a lot of companies competing for exactly that. So you're right. We're not there yet. That's why I say we're in the internet of 1992. There's no DNS, there's no web. You use Archer and Gopher to get information. Sending an email is an exercise in frustration, and you have to compile all of your software. Right? Still two years away from Netscape. That's where we are. And that means that for now, this is not going to be a broad-based phenomenon. It is going to be something that requires a lot of technical skill. We are not the early adopters. Those of us who are involved in Bitcoin, we are the lunatic fringe. The early adopters are five years out. <coughs> right? That's what it means to be involved in this space. And it's okay. Um, if your friends are making fun of you, you're probably doing something interesting. <laughs>